Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at D2S with Aki Fujimura, who's going to talk today about the big changes in computing. Aki, we've been advancing along Moore's Law for a long time, and we continue to go there, but we're starting to run out of steam. What's the next step, and what's changing? Um, I think uh, computational changes in the world has been really substantial since the time that EDA or uh, the CAD systems behind semiconductor design uh, had been uh, really invented. Uh, they were invented back in the 1980s um, uh, where people started to uh, think about fully synchronous design, uh, Manhattan assumption in physical design, and all of these things really got embedded into how all of the different components, synthesis, simulation, place and route, uh, custom design, all these things got uh, put together. Um, and uh, it, uh, it's been uh, quite a huge change on the computing side in the same time. Uh, this slide is showing that uh, there's uh, a Cray 2, which was the fastest computer man could buy for any amount of money. It happened to be $15 million back then uh, for 1.9 gigaflops, right? And to contrast, now, you know, my son can get a, uh, a workstation that has a $2,000 uh, GPU board on it, and uh, uh, it can do 60 million times in price performance. It's only $2,000 and, and it's many, many teraflops, right? Teraflops. And so uh, that difference is uh, uh, enables or should enable something very different from what was assumed to be possible back when the general EDA flow was established. One of the things we always hear is that we have so much power that we're never going to be able to use it. I think when we went back, way back into the, the days of the Cray, everybody thought, oh, we can put the whole Library of Congress on a single disk and that we'll never need any more. Reality is we just keep producing data, more and more data, and we need to process this a lot more. And with AI, we need to even process more, right? Yeah, so uh, deep learning is a great example of uh, what I call useful waste that can be very, very strong in how you can take advantage of this 60 million times difference. Um, similarly, I think there is a, uh, a discontinuity that's about coming up uh, on the EDA physical design side. And um, there's been uh, a long-standing assumption, which I really had something to do with in the beginning, um, uh, that the uh, designs are Manhattan. You have one layer that's predominantly one direction and another layer that's predominantly 90 degrees in the other direction and so on, up uh, you know, uh, more than 10 layers of those. And it's, um, I think it's about time that that assumption got broken and it happens that on the manufacturing side, uh, there's a, a discontinuity right now uh, that enables this to happen. So Pretty much what you're doing here is blowing your assumptions away, right? They're completely different now than what they were going back into this, this era. Right, so um, in a different world, um, outside of EDA, and in the world of gaming, uh, you can see that CPU-based computing-based assumptions and GPU-based computing assumptions can create a, a vastly different landscape of possible outcomes. And if you have the world's most popular game ever called uh, by Mojang called Minecraft, and you can see that there's like a lot of rectangular shapes. And a lot of this is because it needs to run on any platform, including CPUs, phones, and, and all that. And if you can't make the assumption that your computing platform has GPUs on it, then you want to be able to draw fast enough to be interactive. Well, that makes, gives you a certain, amount, certain choice about design choice about what kind of a game you want to create. And on the right here is uh, the Stranding. It's not a very popular game, but it won awards for best graphics. And uh, you can see that it's completely assuming that there's a GPU platform behind it. So if you can make a certain platform and software combination 
as a design decision, you would decide to do very different things. And similar things, we think, is possible now in creating more a world like on the right with semiconductor design and less the world like the left in semiconductor design. You've been watching a lot of this for years. You've been started out in design and you moved into manufacturing. What's How does that bridge together? What's changed there? Well, uh, I was a tangent uh, back in the 1980s, uh, just when that Cray 2 was, uh, we, we never used the Cray 2, of course, right? right. Cool. And a uh, tangent, we invented the over the cell uh, place and weld style. And prior to tangent, uh, we used to have uh, uh, rows of standard cells and routing in between them. and. Uh, what Tangent enabled was to create a new style of place and route that has uh, all layers of metal totally over the cell. And that was new at the time. Of course, that's what everybody does today, but that was new at the time. Uh, and then uh, in 1990s, I uh, went back into uh, place and route again and worked on this thing, thing called the X architecture, which used um, uh, metal four going diagonally, metal five going uh, 90 degree opposite in the same diagonal uh, uh, sense uh, and, and, and draw uh, kind of pictures like that. You can see that the use of diagonals is inside the lower layers as well. So there's a sense of omnidirectional routing, but it's restricted to 45 degrees because of the way the uh, manufacturing uh, limited that. Uh, manufacturing couldn't do anything more than 45 degrees. So, um, so we uh, looked at the benefits, 20% uh, power savings for the entire chip, uh, for example, uh, a clock routing having less skew, and you know, there's many, many, many uh, different benefits of being able to do diagonal routing, and that leads to uh, my thinking that a, a curvilinear design can do even better than that because now manufacturing is not limited. Uh, at D2S, what we do now is uh, we work on curvilinear mask designs. That's different from uh, a curvilinear designs where we think it's going to go. But uh, curvilinear mask designs have uh, benefits that I'll talk about a little bit. How long has curvilinear been on the drawing board? We've been hearing about it for years, but how advanced is it now? Is it ready for prime time, and when did it actually come about? Yeah, so uh, semiconductors are manufactured by first making the mask, and then the mask exposes the wafer, or, well, many, many wafers, right? One mask exposes many, many wafers. And what we're talking about here is curvilinear masks designs, right? So. Uh, uh, this picture is a, uh, an output from a D2S program that does inverse lithography technology or a fancy version of optical proximity correction. And uh, uh, it's a mask design for getting the wave, uh, best wafer output possible. There was always a demand for uh, increased density inside of chips, and you always got there by Moore's Law scaling. What pushed curvilinear design into the forefront here? So uh, wafer quality is improved by having the flexibility of having any shape on the mask. And uh, 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 it turns out that in uh, advanced nodes, you want as much lithographic performance as possible to make the wafer reliably print every time. Okay, Fujimura, thanks for a great explanation. Thank you.